good, isn't he? If you have your Bibles, turn to page uh, 455, I mean, uh, the book of Esther. And I'm going to kind of go through the whole book of Esther today, since it's the, the Feast of Prim, a celebration of Prim. And I'm going to just give you the, the go to uh, chapter 9, I'm going to start there, and then I'll go back and tell you the story, if you will. Some of you know the story, but I just want to remind you of this day. And we're going to go through all the feasts this year. We're going to celebrate, not so much celebrate them, but we're going to teach on them. Uh, the week before Easter, uh, which is Passover Sunday, which is Passover actually comes the Tuesday before Easter, but Mike Berkowitz, Michael Berkowitz is going to come and share with us uh, Passover again. We um, talked to him last night, he said, what do you want me to do on Passover? I said, well, teach us about Passover, tell us the truth about what happened, and then tie it into why we as Christians should celebrate these feasts, or at least recognize these feasts. And so that's what we're going to do this year. We're going to we're going to teach them, and we're going to tell you why they're important to you and to us as believers. Um, I'm not as, going as far as saying that we should celebrate them like this uh, mandatory, but we should know about them because each one of the feasts really shows Jesus and represents Jesus uh, uh, to the Jewish people. And when we look at it as believers, we can say, oh, I see that, because that lamb that was sacrificed is Jesus who died for our sins. He was a sacrificial lamb, and his blood was shed and sprinkled on the altar for our forgiveness of our sins. And we know that because we, we now see and have a revelation of who Jesus is in our lives. And so that's why we want to do this. The book of Esther is really kind of interesting because it never mentions God. It never mentions God in the whole book. So it's like, in all the other books talk about God did this, God did that, you know, and he uh, did some kind of instruction. So it was always one of these things. But in Esther, it's never mentioned, but you can see the very hand of God in the book of Esther as you go through it. You say, well, God did that, and God revealed that, and then this happened. Wow, that God delivered the children of Israel, but he's never mentioned. Because Esther and Mordecai had a heart after God. See, they were already loving God and worshiping God. When they called for a fast for three days, it was because they had a relationship with God. Because they knew they couldn't get out of the situation that they were in unless they called upon a real God. But they never mentioned his name in the book. They just We could just assume that. So let's look at chapter 9 and verse 18. In my Bible it says, Prim celebrated. And the Jewish in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and the 14th, and then on the 15th day they rested and made the day of fasting and joy. So the 14th and 15th day was yesterday and today is the same day in, in, the, in the month of Adar. If I said that right, A-D-A-R. Uh, and that's this month in the Jewish calendar also. So we're celebrating and we're really talking about today just like it is in the Jewish calendar. It just happened to fall on the day that we decided as a church to have a prayer night. Amen? How good is God? Amen? I didn't even know that. It all lined up. That's what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is doing so much in our city. Uh, that, uh, verse 19. That is why um, rural Jews, those living in the villages, observe the 14th and 15th month of Adar as a day of joy and fasting, a day of giving presents to each other. Now, how do you really like to get presents? So if you decide to celebrate this feast, then you can give presents to each other because it's celebrating the deliverance of the Jewish people from the from the annihilation. And Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the province of King Xerxes, uh, near, the, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relieved uh, from their enemies, and as the month, uh, and as that month, when their sorrows turned to joy and their mourning into joy of celebrations. How many have sometimes been in that situation where you're sorrowful, you're mourning, and all of a sudden God shows up and you got you get a little happy? Amen. How did God do that again? I don't know, but he did it. Praise the Lord. And it should be that celebration. That's why we celebrate this time. So let's go back to the beginning in chapter 1. I'm just going to gotta go through it. I'm not going to read a lot. I'm just going to tell you the story. But in chapter 1, we see the king having a great celebration. He ordered all his noblemen and all the kings and priests throughout the region of, of uh, his kingdom, the, the Persia, to come to his palace and had this huge celebration. 
and they were drinking a lot, and they were eating anything they wanted. As a matter of fact, he told the eunuchs that were in charge of the food and, and um, uh, being the servers, he says, whatever they want, give them. So whatever food they wanted, they, they could have, whatever kind of drink they want, as much wine as they wanted to drink, they could drink, and they were drunk. And as the celebration went on, the king decided that he wanted his princess, his queen, to come out, and he was going to display his wondrous king to all the noblemen and all the, the dignitaries that were there. And guess what she did? She decided she didn't want to go out. She didn't want to dress up, and she wanted to display her beauty in front of all those men. I get it. I would probably do the same thing. But she said, no way. But guess what? When you're a queen, you got to do what the king says. And matter of fact, if you don't do what the king says, he could chop off your head. You would die. And she still decided that she would do it. So the king, instead of making a hasty decision, got all his counsels together, and he asked them, what do I need to do? And they said, they agreed that if you don't do something, all the women in all the provinces will not obey their husbands because of what the queen did. So women's lib wasn't going on back then, right? You're, it was not going to happen. So they were going to say, this ain't going to happen. They have to obey their husbands. Wow. And uh, the, I'm preaching this in my church, right? So women, wife, obey me. She says, and I know she's in charge of everything, so it's okay. I'm, I'm good with that. So anyway, they go back, and they decide that they needed to excommunicate the queen, and she was no longer, they took her, her authority away, and she was exiled, and uh, they started looking for a new queen. So on that day, what they did is they were looking for a new queen. She had to be a virgin. And so out throughout the whole province, they went out and he sent his noblemen to go out and find the most beautiful uh, virgins throughout the whole land. And Esther was picked. Now Esther's mom and dad passed away. They died. It doesn't say how it happened. But she was now the daughter of Mordecai. Mordecai took her in her, his home and treated her, as the Word of God says in chapter 2, as his own daughter. And so she was uh, found to be beautiful and beautiful. Uh, gorgeous. I don't know what you could look at the right term to use. Uh, I haven't used that in a long time. Just tell my honey how much I love her, how beautiful she is. But um, she was a most beautiful look. She was a beautiful girl. She went to the palace with all the other virgin girls, and she found favor uh, with all the eunuchs that were in charge of those girls, and uh, even with the other girls that were there. She was more, more beautiful. She was more intelligent. She was just found with, with much favor. And the king, when, and what happened is they would have like a little interview that they go into the king and they would spend time with the king. And if the king liked her, then he would place a crown on her and that was, she would be, uh, then they'd eventually be married. And so when Esther was, it was her turn to go into the king, guess what happened? He fell in love with her. <coughs> like instantly. I mean, this girl is hot. Did I say that in church? She was gorgeous. He loved her. And eventually, we'll find out that Esther even loved him. And during this time when she got picked, she was getting prepared. Now, this was a, a long, uh, over a year. There was a year where she was soaked in perfume. I don't know how they would do that. They would go to a perfume bath for uh, a year. I mean, she smelled good, I guess. I mean... You, after being a perfume and, and taking care of that way and primped and looked really pretty and that was and after that she was married. Now during this time, Mordecai found out there was a couple of noblemen that the king had under his control that plotted to kill the king. Mordecai heard this in the court and he told uh, the king or his his uh, guards and they. Did, they researched it and found out it was true, and they arrested those guys and they hung them in the gallows. And then the, the story goes on. When it came time for the king, well, the king one night, I'm telling you this, I'm just kind of going through this quickly. The king one night was uh, sleeping, or couldn't sleep, and he asked for. 
the scribes or the read of the recordings that's in the, the books, everything's recorded. And then he came across a story about Mordecai saving the king. And they found out that the king um, never rewarded Mordecai. And so Haman, who hated the Jews, and just before that, uh, tripped the king into writing the decree to kill all the Jews because he hated Mordecai. He hated Mordecai so bad that he just wanted to kill all, kill him. And he didn't know how to do it, so he tricked the king and found out that Mordecai was Jewish. So he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the king that there's uh, people that are against him, and if there's people against him, uh, we're going to get the king to write a decree to kill all those people. So the king said, if there's people against me, then I want to get rid of them. So he writes a decree that all the Jewish people would be killed. And Haman was happy because now he started building gallow, a gallow, if you will, near his home. So he could hang Mordecai and all his people. And this decree went out to kill the Jewish people throughout his whole land, all, all of Persia. So every town, every village uh, heard about this. And the Jewish people were fearful for their lives. And Mordecai uh, told Esther this story, what happened. And what they did, if you look in... Um, Chapter 4, in verse 3, it says, Every province in which the, the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning, and among the, the Jews, with among the Jews, with fasting and weeping they wailed. So as soon as they heard this, this horrible decree, they went into fasting and prayer. Can you say amen? Amen. Point number one. When you come into trials and tribulations in your life, what's the first thing you do? When you get into financial issues, it, this is kind of something that I've, I've learned through the years. You get into a financial problem, the first thing we do is go find out what other credit card we can apply for so we can take care of that financial issue instead of going to God. Come on. Yeah. Huh? Or, or, yeah, every time we get into a financial problem, we go to our friends and ask them for help or we call somebody, right? But what's the first thing we really should do? We should pray and ask God, amen? What if we have a relation problem? What do we do? We cry out to everybody else, but we, we never cry out to God. What if you have pain in your body? Come on. What's the first thing we do? We go to the medicine cabinet and see, okay, what do we have? What will work for this headache or this body ache or whatever it is? I got a lot of aches in my body. But I just want to encourage you, the first thing we do, or you should do, or we should do, Never say you because then you make people feel bad. We as believers in God, the creator of this world, the one who provided salvation for us, who do we go to? God, help me. And he said he would. It doesn't matter how old you are. You could be the youngest child here or the oldest person. I always pick on Lewis when I say that, but he's not here today. So Let's see, probably Tom is the oldest one. From the youngest to oldest, we can cry out to God. And the Jewish people did. They cried out to the Lord. And the Lord heard them. And this is how he heard them. Now this plot was being done. Now uh, uh, Haman was, was ready to, to execute this decree. And then all of a sudden the king couldn't sleep. I said, I've got ahead of my story a little bit. The king couldn't sleep. And he started reading what happened. And all of a sudden he found out Mordecai never got rewarded for what he did. Mordecai was never uh, was never rewarded. The king said, "Would never." So he says to the, his scribes, "He goes, hey, who's in the court? Who's up, who's in the court right now?" And Haman just happened to be walking in the court, right? So he says, "Hey, get Haman over here, and I'm going to ask Haman this question." And this is in verse six, uh, chapter six. He says to, to Haman, "Haman, what should I do to the man that's done a great thing for the king?" And Haman, thinking it was for himself, he says, "You should." Give the, uh, you should place your robe on him, on him, you should put a crown on him, you should give him his ring, you should get to the best horse, the best carriage, and decorate it, and have somebody go before him say, this is, stand before him and say, this is what happens to those that are good to the king. You shout out to the people and take them to the, to the, uh, to the city. And so the king says, hey, that's a good idea. We'll do that. So he tells Haman, who hated Mordecai, 
Mordecai, I want you to do the same that you just said, everything that you said, and do it for Mordecai. And Haman, oh my goodness, he was ticked off. He could not believe that he has to now take the guy that he hates through the city. God does things, doesn't he? He'll reward you. You'll never, your enemy will bless you. He'll take care of you, amen? It's amazing what will happen. And here, here it goes. Mordecai is um, um, getting all dressed up and rewarded for all the things that he did. And Haman is taking him through the city. Can you see it? This is what happens to those that honor the king. This is what happened to the man that honors the king. He's saying this to Mordecai always. And it says at the end, it says that he, he got done in verse uh, down in uh, verse 12 or so. He said he, he got done with that. He went home and he put his face in his wife's wife. He said, I can't believe what I had to do. I had to take Mordecai and do this today throughout the whole city. He was just so distraught and so mad. He told all his friends. and He just was so mad because these are the people he wanted to annihilate. Not just kill, not to just get out of the city, but annihilate all of Persia. He was so mad at them. And this just engulfed his anger even more. And then um, uh, Haman uh, went to Esther and told her about this plot to kill all the kings, and Esther, and then passed it, as we saw earlier, but now Esther is going to do something, and she told her, 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 uh, the handmaidens that helped her get ready, and he went to her, and went to them, and said, listen, we're going to fast for three days, he told Mordecai, we're going to fast for three days, and then we're going to go into the king, how many ever fasted for three days, no food, no water, nothing, and three days is easy, no water, no food for three days, just seeking the Lord, Amen. Sometimes in our busy schedule today, we don't even realize uh, it's kind of hard to do that. We go to work. We got to take care of our families. You know, there's a lot of things that we have to do. So when we do a fast, you need to let people know around you that you're fasting. That's what King, uh, Queen Esther did. She let them all know, listen, I'm not going to eat any food. You're not going to eat any food. We're going to just fast and seek my Lord or seek my God. And so they all agreed. And it's, sometimes you need to let your pe the people around you know that, hey, I'm fasting. I'm, not, I'm seeking God. I want to know God's will for the situation in my life. I want to know God. I don't want to be, I, want to, I don't want my human thinking to figure this situation out. I need a supernatural. I need a download from God, if you will. Something that's going to help me in my situation. And even if you don't get the answer that you want, listen to me. After fasting, it doesn't matter. Because God's in control. Amen? Sometimes we don't get the answer that we want. God has his answer for our life. Because maybe it's us getting our will into God's will. When I fast, I spend more time reading in the Word. I spend more time communicating with God. I try to do less activities. I want to spend time with the Lord. Amen? And I think it's, it's encouraging that if you're going through a situation in your life that you don't have an answer to, I would encourage you to fast. Amen? And if you've got health problems, just think about that for a little bit. There's like we do the Daniel fast in, the, in January. You know, we eat a little bit of a natural food and it's, uh, throughout the day, nothing a lot. But you just you're not you're denying yourself what you want. Instead of eating that big steak dinner, you say, No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna eat that. Instead of eating those donuts, I'm not gonna eat those, right? Instead of there's things that you say. And but three days is not bad. Some people I, I've been on a 14th day fast. I've never been really on a 30 day fast, but that's probably coming. Why? Because I want God's will for this place, and I want God's will for the city of Madison. Amen? I want a youth pastor that loves God on fire to love this youth. Amen? And I, can't, I don't know how that's going to happen. It happens because it, it can happen if I have a lot of money in the bank, I could pay somebody to come. And if somebody does come, I need to pay them, right? So we need to have that. So God, I need the finances so I can hire a young couple or even a young man or a young woman to come and take care and love on our youth. And I want somebody that has a love for God first. Amen. They can be silly and goofy and all the stuff that you pastors do. I want that. But I want them to have a love for God. Um, I guess that's my only qualification, right? Uh, so you pray with me. We want the, that to happen. It might not happen. And remember when um, in the Bible where the, the uh, disciples went and casted out demons? You remember in the New Testament where he cast out demons and, it, and the demons came back and attacked the disciples? Do you remember that? And, 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 the, and he said, well, why did that happen? And she said, oh, somebody's only come out by prayer and fasting. So the, even Jesus recommended that we pray and we fast. So look that up. Well, Esther did that. She, she went and she was going to, and everybody knows this part of the story, right? Esther went into the king, right? So Esther gets her all beautiful up and pretty and got her nice dress on and, and had her hair all done and, 
makeup was just perfect and all those things, right? And then he goes, he goes into the courtyard where the king is, the court where the king is, and the king's sitting on his throne with his golden scepter. And when you go to, if you go to the king unannounced in this, in this time and age, if the king didn't want you to be there and you came unannounced, then he would extend his scepter to you and they would take you off and chop your head off because you weren't supposed to be there. And Esther knew that. Her life was in danger. That's why she called for the fast. I could die today if I, when I go into the king, but I have to go into the king and let them know that my people are in danger. So her heart was happy, but knew that she had to do the right thing. And even if her life, if her life ended that day, she knew that she had at least a try to save her people. Amen? Laying her life down for her people. And so when he went in, the king saw her, and she was beautiful, of course, and gorgeous. And he extended her, his scepter towards her. And she came, and she touched the scepter. And when she touched it, that, meant, that was like, I accept your authority. I yield to your authority. I know who you are. I recognize who you are. And she bowed down, she touched the scepter, and the king says, what do you need? Matter of fact, whatever you need, I will give you up to half of the kingdom. That's how much he loved her. Half of the kingdom was hers. It was all she had to ask for, ask for, and it was hers. She said, no, I don't want anything. All I want from you, king, is that you would come to a banquet that I have prepared for you. And you and Haman come. And Haman was all excited because now he was, he was invited to this banquet with the queen. And the king, this is pretty cool, this is pretty special. He liked that, he liked being in charge, he liked the authority that he got. And so they had the banquet, at the banquet, the king asked her what she wanted, and, it's, and the queen, I mean, women are so good at this stuff, you know? I mean, just bringing the guy in, and, and just getting them what they, get, get what they want, right? Can I have that credit card, please? I love you, baby. And, oh, sure, just go to school and get whatever you want, right? We just love that stuff. We take care of our girls, right? We want them to feel happy and beautiful. We want them to have stuff. I mean, it's like, like how God created man to take care of the lady. And a lady loves pleasing the guys. That's the way it, it works. But, um, and Queen Esther knew that. And Queen Esther went into the, into the, uh, uh, asked the king if you would just come, would you, if it pleased the king and hey man, would you please just come to another banquet I'm preparing for you tomorrow? So I'm thinking, I was, when I was reading this again, I was thinking, what, what did the king think? Like, okay, we had this beautiful banquet, it was wonderful, wonderful food, uh, the food that he liked, of course, she made, and then he slept, he went to bed that night, thinking about, wow, I get to do this again tomorrow, I get to be with my beautiful bride, and then Haman's probably thinking, wow, I wonder what special things she has for me, and, you know, they just were all excited, couldn't wait for the next day, the next day comes, and she prepared, and her, her ladies had prepared this beautiful meal for the king and Haman, and then the king says again, hey, you can have up to half of the kingdom. Whatever you want, it's yours. And she says, all I want is my life, king. And I want my people to be saved. Because then she tells them there's a plot against them. And they're like, who made this plot? Who said this? And it was like, Haman. And the king was so ticked off. Can I use that word in church? He was so mad he left. He went out in the courtyard, tried to get his sentence. A lot of the, like, like, it tells you earlier in the story that the king, when he made, had to make major decisions, would go and get his advisors and say, "Hey, what do I need to do?" He was so mad. He comes back, and in while he was gone, Haman's there pleading with the king, queen, "Please spare my life." And she's like, "I have nothing, nothing to do with it." So he's begging her, he, and I don't know how, I don't know exactly how it was, but it says that he. She was on her own bench, so he was there on the bench with her. And then the king walks in thinking, he even wants to take my bride. I mean, he was really, man, now here's this, this guy begging her. He must be on his knees or what, touching her. I don't know what he was doing, but it was enough to make the king think that he wanted to take her as his bride or his own wife. And he got really mad. And so then um, we find out that it, um, Esther tells him, the king, that Mordecai had even had a gallows uh, prepared for them, for the Jewish people. So immediately, uh, what happened to Haman? The king says, go take them to the gallows. And that was, re there was rejoicing because now Esther and her family would be spared. 
So then she goes back to the king even after this and tells the king, listen, you made a decree that said all the Jewish people are going to die here soon. You need to write another decree and tell all the land that, um, that to not to kill the Jewish people. And they did that. And that's where we get the, that's why we do the celebration of prayer. Because when the decree went out to all the land, all the Jewish people then were spared, and they actually had permission to kill their enemies, and they did. You can read about that at the end uh, of the story, that they were all, they were all uh, spared, and uh, all those, those that were um, the enemies of the Jewish people actually uh, died, and God gave them power over all of them, and thousands of people died because of they were enemies of the Jewish people. How many know that Jewish people are, have a lot of enemies against them right now? And how many know that uh, even this world, I mean, overall, I mean, all the Iranis, uh, the Egyptians, you name it, are against all those that are Jewish and those that are Christians. And how many here today feel like the whole world's against you and you feel like, I just can't do this anymore? Huh? It's, a, it's a hard thing being a Christian because the enemy of our souls, the devil, is seeking who he may destroy. And it's like the Jewish people here, they, were, they had a fight, but the fight, it was, sometimes our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against spiritual forces. That's what the book of Romans tells us. Amen? Sometimes we fight so much and we, we, we don't understand the things of God. This story is a beautiful story. It never mentions God in here, but we see God's hand, especially the time when, when Mordecai was going to go get rewarded by the king and found out he had to a, a bless the person that he hated. Uh, uh, I mean, Haman uh, had to bless... Mordecai and take him through the streets. That was, I think that was, I mean, I, I think God has a sense of humor, right? I think God knows who your enemy is, and God knows what you're fighting. Amen? And all we have to do, folks, listen, all we have to do today, is we, all we have to do is believe that God has your best interest at heart. And every situation that we go through is to help us build our faith and belief in Him. Amen? All we have to do is trust and obey and believe that what God has for you is the best for your life. If you would believe that Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. If you believe that this Son came and sacrificed His own life and His own blood for you and for me. If we simply believe that the enemy that we think we're fighting, God has already given us the victory. We just have to believe that. Amen? God already sees you as his sons and daughters. God already sees you with a royal robe put around you and a crown on your head. God already sees you with a ring that of his authority on your finger and your shoes are, are given uh, by him. Amen? God already sees you dressed in white and in royalty. Amen? We just have to see ourselves that way. We have to see ourselves as God's children, as, as Esther was, even when she lost her parents and was adopted by her, her uncle and, and went through all those things. God had his hand on her life, just like he has his hand on your life. Listen, I want to encourage you this morning. We don't have to be defeated Christians. We don't have to look at ourselves as not worthy or not good enough. That thought, that very thought is from the enemy. That very thought that you're not worthy or not good enough comes from not from God, but from the enemy that will put you down and not encourage you or not strengthen you. The God wants you to know that by His Spirit, you can have all that He promised. You don't have to walk. God sent His Spirit in this world to teach us, to guide us, to give us power to overcome the enemy. We can't just be satisfied with coming to church on Sunday morning. We have to know that God walks with you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. He's there with you. Listen, young people, now God is with you, and He wants to let, let you know that He loves you, and He cares about you. And He knows what you struggle, and He knows your thoughts, He knows everything you're going through, and He cares about you anyway. Can you say amen? Because sometimes it just feels like, what am I here for? Listen to Pastor Bob, talk, 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 talk. When is it going to be over? So I can get something to eat. Because we had to rush out of the house this morning and couldn't get nothing to eat this morning. I get it. But I also get this. That faith comes by hearing and hearing His Word. And hearing people that believe that God is real. Because the world around you will tell you everything different. 
Matter of fact, in our city, you can not believe in God, and it's cool. It's all right. It's kind of like accepted. You can just believe anything you want. Do anything you want. It's okay. That's the that's norm in Madison, Wisconsin. But it's not the norm with God. Because I want to tell you, let me just give you a warning, and then I want to pray for you. Is that okay? Because I just think the time, we need to realize it's kind of time to quit playing around. We have to really be serious about this thing. And let our children and our children's children know that, hey, this time is short. At the end of, end of the book of Revelation, if you don't mind, if you will turn there with me. I read this last night. I just feel like reading it again. I think I said this last week, too, so maybe it's important. As you read the, read the book, of, book of Revelation, and, and if, you're, if you study just a little bit about it, you can see so many things are being fulfilled even now. It's not like something's going to happen. You know, sometimes we walk in this Christian thing that it's all in the future. It's all like way going on. It's gonna, this is going to happen. And, you know, it's like way in the distance, but really it's not. This book is now being fulfilled today. And we'll get into more, more of that over the weeks, okay? And share with you how uh, we believe that in the next couple of years, you know, there's some significant things going to happen in the world. And uh, uh, I won't get into all that right now, but I just want to know that there's some significant things we're going to teach on. I'm going to show you that, you know, this, we're in the end times. <laughs> or this is happening all across the world. And it's not like something, you know, it's like get ready now. Don't get ready later. Don't like put this relationship off. Know that you've got you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior now because if you wait, it's too late. There's going to be a, uh, in, in Matthew 25 and 26, uh, you know, there's going to be a judgment coming. There's going to be sheep and goats. So the sheep are going to be all those people on the right hand of God and all the goats are go those that are going to go to hell. Uh, did I say hell in church? I did. So they're going to go down that way. They're going to take the elevator down, and the other ones are going to take the elevator up, if you will. That judgment's coming on the earth. I want to be the. I want to be on the up elevator, amen. If you will, like you see those cartoons, but anyway. But look at verse. Look at um, Revelation chapter twenty-one or twenty-two, excuse me. And it says in verse uh, seventeen. This was word that Jesus had spoken these words. Or if you back up just a little bit, let's go to verse 7. It says, Behold, I am coming soon. Who said that? Jesus, Jesus said that. He said, Behold, I am coming soon. Uh, blessed is he who keeps the words and the prophecies of this book. This book right here. Amen? You keep these words, even if you just take, if you throw all the, book, all the other books away, just keep the book of Revelation, even in that book alone. Even in that book alone, you, you see the salvation of God and the love of God in, in, in just the book of Revelation alone. But in this book, it says, and it says John was writing this. It says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I have heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the, at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, do not do this. I want to let you know we've got angels in this city and in this place, and around you. And those angels will help us bring us to God. Say, well, I don't know about all angels. You know, God never wants us to preach on angels. He said, don't preach on angels. Don't teach angelology. Just know that they're there. They're there. When a, when a youth bus got ran into a, a, a telephone pole, and the pole came over the bus, the second bus that came to this location, the youth that were in the restaurant, I think it was McDonald's or, or Wendy's, they were looking out the window and seeing this telephone pole falling over their friends in this bus. These two men up here, they opened the back of the bus and they lift up the students and they put them over the electrical wires, right? They put them over the electrical wires. When the police and the fire department got there, they went to turn to find those guys that were gone. Who were they? I believe there were angels protecting those children from harm. Amen? They're here. But don't worship them. That's what, the, what John is saying. Don't worship them. Every time you see the angel in the Bible, even when Mary and the angel came over Mary, and Mary wanted to bow down and worship the angel, the angel said, no, no, no. There's only one person you're going to ever bow down to, and that's Jesus. Amen? And you bow down to him and him only. Amen? And that's what's going to happen at the end time. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? All of us will bow down one day. 
And those that don't believe are going to bow down. Amen? We're all going to bow down to him. He says, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and the prophets and of all who keep the word of this book. Worship God, he says. Don't worship me, worship God. Then he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Why does it say that? Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy to be holy. Why does John write that? Because he said, there's no time left. If you're going to be bad, then just go be bad. Because you got to serve God now. It's, it's too late. Because the end is coming. Serve him. And then Jesus said, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give it to you, everyone, according to what he has done. So you are going to be rewarded for what you have done. So if you're a lazy Christian, guess what? You're not going to get much. If you're busy about God's work, you're going to get some stuff. What does that mean? In the crown that you're going to get, God's going to reward everybody with a crown. Richard's going to have a huge crown. <laughs> it's going to be big. He's going to have all these rewards. He will never admit it. But God is blessing this man. And God's blessing his ministry. I'm telling you, he's going to be rewarded. And I know he doesn't like me they say that, but I just say that because I know. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to, he's going to take that crown just like I'm going to do. And I'm going to lay it at the feet of Jesus because I can do nothing without him. I couldn't stand here today and do what I do. Only because of Jesus. Amen? My special ed teacher would be amazed that I could sit and preach for 35 minutes or 40 minutes. Huh? I, would, I, I had a speech problem. I, I can't even, I stutter all the time but in, in, in middle school. And here I am preaching to you. That's just, it still amazes me. I tell, the teacher, I tell God, you must have a sense of humor. Bring me to a city that half the people have a PhD. You know, to be a preacher. Hey, okay. God does stuff. Amen. And God will use you a lot. He can use me, he can use you. Amen. He can. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are dogs, those who practice magic arts and sexual immorality, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practice falsehood. What's he saying? Listen, he's telling the believers, wash yourself. Take off the junk that's like the world. Cleanse yourself in the blood of Jesus. Let him change you and take away your sin. If you don't wash yourself in his blood, then you're going to be outside the gates. Man, somebody coming in here that's not a Christian go, what do you mean wash myself in blood? I mean, this is a word church. You know what I'm saying? Jesus' blood was shed that our sins may for, be forgiven. We need to ask Him to forgive us of our sins. We need to wash ourselves. God, if there's any impure thing, any unholy thought, anything that I do is unrighteous, God, please take them out of my life. Come on, folks. This is the most important thing. Esther had a purified herself. She was soaked in the perfume and, and, and all those wonderful herbs so she could smell good. We need to wash ourselves in the blood of Jesus so we can be pure and holy. And when we go before the king, we're going to look beautiful because his blood cleanses us. Hallelujah. God will take our sins away. All we have to do is believe. All we have to do is ask. Lord, please forgive me. I, Jesus, look at the verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent an angel to give you this testimony for the churches. Who is it for? It's for you and me. It's for the churches. It's for the believers throughout the whole world. This gospel, this message that Jesus said is for everyone that believes, for every one of us. Purify ourselves, those that are in the churches. I am the root, Jesus is the root, and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Now look what it says next. Might get excited here. The spirit of the bride, the spirit of God, and the bride. You are the bride. You and me. We're beautiful. We got a nice robe on. It's white. It's pure. It's holy because of Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. We're adoring. We're getting ourselves ready to meet our King, Jesus. 
It took years for, for Esther. It took a year and a half for her to be soaked in the in those uh, herbs and uh, those those perfumes so she could be ready to be presented to the king. It's time now for us to get ready. Get ready. Get your robes white. Get them pure. Get yourself holy. Make yourself ready for the king is coming. Amen. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever is, uh, wishes, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life. And then he goes on to say, don't take a word away from this prophecy. This is a prophecy. A prophecy is going to be fulfilled. I mean, Jesus said this prophecy is going to come to pass. Ready. Hallelujah. How many would say today, just look up here. Everybody look up here. How many would say, I would say this openly because you know, there's no secrets of God, right? How many say today I need to make myself ready? Would you just raise your hand? Raise it up high. Don't be embarrassed. Okay, okay, good. Good. Everybody, yes. I need to make myself ready. I need to make myself ready. I need to be holy. I need to be righteous. I need to be what God wants me to be. Amen? Make ourselves ready. Now, no, listen. Listen, we can't be pure and holy by ourselves. We need Jesus to forgive us. He'll do that, but we can't. Sometimes we have to maintain that. I mean, no, I got saved a long time ago, but I've been struggling sometimes. It's been hard. It hasn't been easy to walk this walk. It's been difficult. But I know God said, I knew that I knew you're gonna have trouble with this. I knew you were going to struggle with this. So I'm going to give you somebody to help you along the way. Come on, listen to me. This is important. I'm going to give you somebody to help you walk this walk and talk the talk. And not be a wimpy Christian and not, you know, be stumbling all the time. I'm going to give you some help. I'm going to give you some authority. I'm going to give you a robe. I'm going to put a crown on your head. I'm going to give you some, something to help you. He said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. How many, I mean, you know, I preach on the Holy Spirit a lot. Why? Because we're, we can be powerful in our walk with God if we understand that we, all we have to do is listen to the Holy Spirit who continually speaks to us as small, still voices to our ear. No, don't talk like that. No, you don't have to be that way. Don't do that. Don't touch that or don't walk in that place you know with evil. The Holy Spirit does that. You're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. When you said, Jesus, come on my heart. Forgive me for my sins. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. You became a believer. But then we have to walk this walk. And oh my goodness, it's hard sometimes, isn't it? Man, it's hard. I, I get so frustrated sometimes when I, when I flesh gets a hold of me and I say things or do things I shouldn't do I'm talking to you as your pastor it's like how do I suppress that I can't do it unless the Holy Spirit helps me amen if you need help with your walk with God you need more awareness of the Holy Spirit stand up where you're at right now just stand I need more awareness of the Spirit of God in my life I need to know that He's right there with me amen everybody hallelujah yes Yes, I need your help, Holy Spirit. Father, you see everybody standing right now. Let's just raise your hands towards heaven just for a minute, not very long. Just for a minute, just raise your hands and just tell, Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need your help right now to, to overcome my situation, to overcome my anger, to overcome my life situation, to overcome my doubt and my fear. Holy Spirit, help me not to question the Word of God, but help me to believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Right where you're at, would you just confess to the Lord whatever you're struggling with? Just ask the Lord to help you right where you're at. Just say, Lord, help me in this area. Help me uh, to not curse. Help me not to uh, have these bad thoughts. Help me to stay away from pornography. Help me to stay away from things that are not pleasing to you, God. Help my hands to be clean, Lord. Help my feet to be clean, God. Help my heart to be pure before you. See, Jesus is coming back for a bride. And since Jesus is coming back for a bride that's without spot 
or without wrinkles. Listen, you know when a bride gets ready for a wedding, that dress is beautiful. That her, her makeup is just right. Her hair is just beautiful. She has the right shoes on. She's beautiful. And Jesus said, I'm coming back for my bride. It's you and me without spider wrinkles. So God, I pray right now over this congregation. Just ask God. Just to the other people in the church right now. God, I pray that we be a bride that would be pure. That we be a bride that has no spots on us. That has no wrinkles in our garments, God. That our thoughts are pure and our heart is after you, God. And our feet will go only places that are pure and our hands will only touch those things that you are pleased with, Lord God. So Father, I thank you that each one of us has stood up and said, yes, we need more of your Holy Spirit. We need to be more aware. So Holy Spirit, I give you permission. I give you permission to tell me when I'm erring and when I'm going in the wrong direction. I, Holy Spirit, help me when I'm about to take something or do something that is improper. Holy Spirit, warn me when I, my mouth is about to say something that's not edifying to another person. Lord, I thank you for that today. Now, Lord, I pray you bless these people. Father, bless each one. Hallelujah. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. Let me pray this blessing over you as we go. Does the Lord bless you? Come on, receive this right now. The Lord bless you. Receive this right now. The Lord bless you. And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Right now, everyone that's here, I want you to receive God's peace. God loves you. And he wants you to have peace, not turmoil in your spirit, but peace inside your heart. So that they will put my name on, their, on Israel and I will bless them. The Lord will bless this children of Capital City Church today. The Lord bless you. The Lord quickly turn his face towards you. And may the Lord give you peace. Would you receive God's peace this morning? Receive his love right now. Just soak it in right now into your spirits. Just accept that God cares for you and he loves you. And that Jesus provided the sacrifice that any guilt or any sin or anything that we're going through can be forgiven. And he sent his spirit to empower you to be his witness. To guide you and lead you. To bring revelation to you of the word of God. To help you be a good dad and a good mom and a good son and a good daughter. God wants you to live in peace. Receive his peace this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then it says in the Feast of Prim, they celebrated because their lives were spared. Can you give God a great shout of joy and say, thank you, Jesus, for setting me free from my guilt. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for providing forgiveness of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Father God, for loving me and providing me a way to you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give God a big clap for